Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Dr. Laura Markham, who's the author of Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, How to Stop Yelling and Start Connecting, Peaceful Parent, Happy Siblings, How to Stop the Fighting and Raise Friends for Life, and now her latest book, The Peaceful Parent Happy Kids Workbook, using mindfulness and connection to raise resilient, joyful children and rediscover your love of parenting. Dr. Laura Markham earned her PhD in clinical psychology at Columbia University and has worked as a parenting coach with countless families across the world. Over 160,000 moms and dads enjoy her free weekly coaching posts via email. And you can sign up on any page of her website, ahaparenting.com, which serves up aha moments for parents of babies through teens. Dr. Laura's aspiration is to change the world one child at a time by supporting parents. The proud mother of two thriving young adults who were raised with her peaceful parenting approach, she lives with her husband in New York. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to have you on the show and to just learn more about you and your wonderful peaceful parenting methods. Okay. I'm glad to be here. So yeah, I just have, you know, different questions that I thought that we could kind of start with since we know your background. And yeah, I think that for me as a parent, I, I always knew that I was going to parent differently than my own parents. But then once you have your own kids and I, I do things so differently than them, you just start to realize why people ended up doing the things that they did and falling into those patterns and how, you know, as a parent, you just, I love that you share that you just really, it goes back to your own self care and mindfulness and connection with yourself so that you can be really present with the children and, and share with them through example, how to be in this world. So I think the first question I want to start with is I saw this on your Instagram and I just loved this question so much is how do children learn empathy? Mm. Well, they learn it from us as they learn so much. And, you know, we think we're teaching, but we don't need to teach it. We just need to model it to do it. Humans are born wanting to connect, wanting to contribute. Because we're a communal species, when we give to someone else and we see their happiness when we share with them, we get a little uh, hit of dopamine and oxytocin and the, the really the feel-good neurotransmitters and hormones circulating in our body whenever we connect with someone warmly. So children are born wanting to connect. And neurologically speaking, we know there are mirror neurons. When we see someone feeling something, we feel some of that ourselves because of the mirror neurons. So children are born moving toward empathy. And when we express empathy toward them, in other words, when we express understanding towards them, they have that feeling of feeling understood, that feeling of resonance with us. And that's what helps them develop psychologically and neurologically so that they can offer empathy to others. That's beautiful. And uh, so my son has a little play group I started for him that he plays in. He's two and a half. And um, I love it because they have if someone gets hurt, they have something in the fridge called healing pads. And they're essentially just like um, fabric covered, like buckwheat holes that are covered in fabric. And they just place it on, you know, where the owie is or wherever. And all the kids love doing that. And it's so sweet. And so I, I find exactly that example to be so true. But at the same time, I, I, my, I feel like and every parent must go through this, but it's like, they're so innocent. And then once they start going to school or learning from other kids, they come home with like 
challenging behavior. And with him, I just felt like he went from this like loving, sweet little boy to coming home and all of a sudden like spitting or um, like hitting and, you know, doing, doing things where I found myself so disappointed because I was like, what, what is happening to my perfect little angel? And so I, I think my initial reaction was, oh my gosh, like my son isn't empathetic. How does he not understand that, that he's hurting me or my husband by doing this? And so I'm curious in the moment when we talk about how to teach them empathy and knowing that they obviously have the capacity to be empathetic, but then, you know, just like how we have emotions and we don't, we are just better at managing them. Hopefully. (laughs) Um, I wonder like in those moments, what are things that we can share with them? Because I've heard like, we try and say, oh, I'm not going to let you hit me. So I have to hold your hands or stuff like that. Because I think in the beginning, I was just like, that hurts me. And I've heard that that's not necessarily the best response. So I'm curious what you would recommend. Well, first of all, it doesn't mean a child is not empathic because they hit or spit or scream at you or anything else. Because think about it for us. You're empathic, I'm empathic, but if we were under threat, the last thing we would feel is empathy. If we felt a threat, you know, there's a robber with a gun, we're not going to feel empathy for that robber. We're going to feel scared and we're going to feel angry and and we're going to, if we think we can, you know, we, we're going to go into fight, flight, or freeze because that's what we do when we're under threat, right? We, we either fight off the threat if we can, or we run from it if we can, right? And if we don't think we can do either, we, we freeze and hope they won't see us. So your son, when he is in a situation where he feels some sort of threat, and the threat could be you said, no, you can't have a cookie. The threat could be you said, time to sit down to eat. The threat could be you said, it's time to leave the playground or go to bed or get out of the bathtub or whatever else. That threat feels like, to him, like a big problem. So the last thing he feels is empathy. He's going to go into fight, flight, or freeze because it's an emergency to him. Now, obviously, it's not an emergency that he has to get out of the bathtub, but he feels like it's an emergency. So he lashes out and he will learn better ways to express his unhappiness about something. And and I'll, I'll model how you might help him learn those better ways. But it really, it doesn't have anything, any um, bearing on whether he's empathic or not at all right? At that moment, he's in a state of emergency, so he's lashing out. Uh, I also think that at his age, he cannot keep in mind his perspective and your perspective at the same time. In fact, he doesn't really know that you have a different perspective. He'll, He'll make a leap when he's probably three and a half, where he'll be able to realize that you know, he put his toy under the couch and you didn't see him do it and you don't know what's under there. But right now, if he did that, he would think, you know, it's there because everybody has the same perspective, he thinks, because he's only two and a half. By three and a half, they their brain has developed more conceptual understanding. They know, oh, you don't know the toy is under there. You have a different perspective right? And that's actually when they develop the capacity to begin lying, really by four, uh, because of this new found capacity. So at that point, he's now able to, oh, she has a different perspective than I do. Maybe it hurts her when I hit her, you know, whereas right now he actually doesn't get that there are different perspectives, right? So he's he doesn't have much prefrontal cortex. He His brain is born pretty unfinished, and even though he's two and a half, his brain is still developing great guns right now. It's just growing unbelievably, beautifully developing every day based on his experience. So how can we help the brain grow in Uh, wisdom so that it notices what's happening and has more understanding of somebody else and knows that hitting is not the way to do it. We start by creating safety. 
by helping him move out of that state of emergency that he's shifted into because you told him he had to do something or couldn't do something. So when he, when, so first of all, before you set a limit, and that's what it is, a limit is, no, you can't have a cookie, or yes, you have to get out of the bathtub. So when you set a limit, you always start by connecting. That creates safety. It also helps the other person feel understood, so they're more likely to cooperate with you. Not always, he's only two and a half, but more likely to. You know, kids don't need everything they want, but they do need to feel understood. So when you say you are loving being in the bathtub, you've been in the bathtub for a half an hour now, and you just love playing with your boats, and it's time to get out now. Now, notice you didn't start by saying, okay, time to get out of the tub. You started by saying, you love it. I see you love it. It's so much fun to splash around with your boats. And it's time to get out. And he says, as every kid does, they may not want to get into the tub, but then they never want to get out, right? So he then says, no, no, I'm not ready. Or since he's two and a half, he may not say I'm not ready. He might just yell no <laughs> and splash at you. And you can say, okay, do you want to get out of the tub now or in five minutes? And he doesn't really know what five minutes is, but he knows it's not now. So he will say, like any child will say, five minutes. And you say, okay, five minutes, we're going to get out of the tub, okay? And when you when it's five minutes, we're going to need to get out. And I know you still won't want to get out of the tub, but you know what we're going to go do. And then you tell him all the great things you're going to go do. So he starts to think maybe it's not so terrible, but he doesn't still want to get out when the five minutes is up. And you say, okay, you've had such a great time. And now it's time to go find, you know, um, find your pajamas and find the book you want to read and snuggle up and and he says, no. And you say, uh, and this could be a situation of fight, flight, or freeze, right? And you say, I know you wish you could stay in the tub forever, don't you? Would you like to stay in the tub and play all night long till the water is icy cold and your, your skin is so cold? Would you like that? You love playing in the tub. And, you know, it, it, giving him his wish, at least in his fantasy, will help a little, but he still doesn't want to get out. But at this point, You've, you've joined with him. You've empathized with how he feels. You've seen it from his perspective. You take him out. Now, let's say he's still really mad about it. Let's say he does hit you at this point, even though you've done all this great prep work. You obviously know this could happen, so you take him out carefully so he's not hopefully hitting you. But, you know, you have to hold him firmly because you're he's slippery at this moment. So, you know, maybe as you put him down, you know, he whacks at you or something. And you say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You are so mad. You know, it's not about setting the limit on the hitting. He knows he's not supposed to hit. You've already been over this with him. It's about acknowledging how he feels. Again, you're connecting first. Connect before you correct or redirect. Whoa, you are so mad. You didn't want to get out of the tub. No hitting. You're setting the limit again. No hitting. Hitting hurts. Hitting hurts. No hitting. Now, you don't have to hold his hands probably because... He's hit you once to express his displeasure. He's probably not wailing on you at this point. Um, and you've got the towel and you wrap him in the towel and, you know, you've wrapped up his arm so he's not hitting you and he might scowl at you or say or scream. And you could say, you are so mad. You're showing me how mad you are. You're screaming. You didn't want to get out of the tub, did you? And then you talk about how much he loves the tub and how he didn't want to get out. And by now he's all dried off and you're taking him in the bedroom and you're getting his pajamas on him and he's cooperating with you. But notice you didn't have, you know, it wasn't a big thing about the hitting. It's like, no, no, no hitting. Hitting hurts. We don't do that. But that's not where your focus was. Your focus was on helping him with his emotions because the emotions, all behavior is driven by emotions and needs. You address the emotion and what he thought was the solution to his need and now he's not going to need to hit because you addressed his emotions. So that was a long answer. It gives a picture. What do you think? No, I think it's great. And I, I totally agree. Like when they do that, instead of being like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you hit me and this and that, or I can't believe you're hurting your dad. It's like just continuing to address and keep moving along and, and saying something. But then I understand like continuing to just 
share with them and moving along and while they cooperate with you, which that definitely I can picture so many moments where we do that. And I guess for me, I'm always curious, like, at what point do you need to fully sit down and like address something? And at what point can you, because I understand, like, I, I really love also, I follow like Janet Lansbury's work in my parenting and stuff. And it's very similar in that sense as well, where I just think, and what I've read through your work and other people's is that when you make it a huge deal, then it just kind of blows up. And so I, I think about this a lot in our home or at school. Like if someone goes and hits another kid, uh, you want to address the situation, um, but not shame them. And it, it's, it just becomes such a fine line because on one hand, you don't want to shame the kid that's doing the hitting because again, we just like walk through the situation and they have so many emotions and, and they just feel a threat essentially. But then you also, I'm, I will say this, I'm the younger sibling. So I come from a younger sibling perspective. I also think it's so important to address for the person who was being essentially hit or abused or whatever in the situation that they need to know that it's not okay to allow people to do that. And I think about this a lot because my son will say something like, um, he has a great friend at school and they recently got into some, like, you know, he bit him and then he hit him or whatever. And, uh, he came home and said to me, that's how we play. And I was thinking, well, that doesn't sound like I, how do I respond to that? Cause he seems fine with it, but I also want to share with him. It's not okay to do that to other people. And it's not okay for other people to do that to you. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, so first of all, there's, there's a lot here. So first of all, it is not okay for people to use violence to solve problems, right? And his problem of getting out of the tub, you know, when he used violence to solve it, we absolutely set a limit on that, right? And you as the younger sibling, it was not okay for an older sibling to hurt you ever. And so my approach, the approach I just described, does not allow hitting to continue. And in fact, yeah. we're addressing the... Um, the what's driving the hitting, right? We're addressing the emotions that are driving it so that won't continue. But, but I think we absolutely expect the child to make a repair. So if he hits someone in his playgroup at the playground or whatever, he hits another child, we would acknowledge you were so mad or you wanted the shovel or he took your shovel and you were mad, you wanted it back. And then we would say, no hitting, hitting hurts, right? So we start by joining, then we empathize. And then we say, your friend was crying when you hit him. It, it, it was an owie, it hurt when you hit him. Let's make it better. We need to go make it better with your friend. What should we do? And so there's always a responsibility of repair whether it's with a sibling or whether it's, you know, on the playground or in school. So I think when people hear us talking about not shaming or blaming the child, they assume that means the child's not accountable. But when a child is expected to repair, they are learning something about holding themselves accountable. It's not about shame or blame. It's about the person they want to be. And it gives them a route back to connection with that other person and with their inner self, the, the person they want to be, their own inner compass. So I think repair is a very important concept to talk about here. And when you said, how do you address this with your son when he comes home and says, that's how we play, I would explore that with him more. So you would ask, so you, you, you bit him and then he hit you. Is that right? And you're, you say that's how you play. Hmm. Did you both like to play that way? Did, did you like it when he hit you? No. Yeah. So playing is when you both like it. Do you think he liked it when you bit him? Yes. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if he liked it when you bit him. 
because then he hit you, right? It's fine to wrestle with your friends. It's fine to to play with your friends and roughhouse and laugh if you're both having fun. And that's, you know, when they're with you and they're roughhousing and you wonder if somebody's about to get hurt, you step in and you say, is everybody having fun with this? Because you notice that one of them has a very tight look on his face and is sort of going after the other one. And you know something's about to happen because they're not having fun with it any longer. And kids don't always know, you know, they can be having fun one minute and then all of a sudden it gets a little out of hand and someone falls down and monks their head or whatever. And they're not having fun anymore. So I think it's important to teach consent from the earliest ages, from two and a half to teach consent. I mean, earlier when they're, when you're changing their diaper and they're little, now I'm putting my hand on you. Now I'm undoing your diaper, right? And when they're with friends and they're playing, you know, are you both having fun? Do you both want to wrestle? You know, I, I'm hearing your friends say he doesn't want you to push him. Or, and then you can also coach your child. You can say, don't push me, please. So you, you give them the words they need to stick up for themselves. Hey, everyone. I want to tell you about a brand of shoes that my husband wears religiously called Saba's. They're the only shoes he wears. And back in 2016, when we got married, we were actually the first wedding to have all of our groomsmen wear Saba's. Saba, spelled S-A-B-A-H, means morning in Turkish, and every pair is handcrafted at the Saba workshop in Gaziantep, Turkey, and initialed by the maker. Saba shoes use all natural ingredients in the tanning process, no cheap synthetics and no paint, which is what I love about it. I love knowing that my husband and I have Saba's too. I love knowing that we're using shoes that are good for us because if you think about it, think about reflexology, think about all the different things that we can absorb through our feet. We talk about earthing, you take in so much from your feet. So you want to make sure that what you're putting on them is not toxic. The quality is reflected first and foremost in the color and feel of the leather and mostly proven in how they age their longevity and ability to be restored and refreshed. One pair of Saba shoes should last you many years with the right care and attention. And although my husband has like 20 plus pairs and is just absolutely obsessed with it. And that's another thing that we love about it because when you spot other people in public wearing them, it feels like you're both in on the same little secret. And that's actually how the brand was founded. Mickey Ashmore, a.k.a. the Saba dealer, the founder, started Saba in 2013 out of his East Village apartment, hosting friends and friends of friends for Turkish coffees and shoe fittings. Since then, Saba has expanded, but the hospitality and personal touch remains the same. So if you're interested in giving them a try, I recommend visiting one of their five Saba house locations in New York, Amagansett, San Francisco, Dallas, or London, or shop online at www.saba.am. Be sure to enter code THEFULLEST in all caps at checkout for complimentary shipping on your order of $75 or more. Saba offers free returns and exchanges and are readily available to assist with any sizing questions. So check them out. We love them. They have slip-ons as well. They have glasses. They have all sorts of other fun things like backgammon and cool bags. And we're just really excited to share about them with you. That's such wonderful advice. I love all that. I love repairing and I love um, just everything you shared. Thank you so much. So I have a question. I am curious. I've heard um, throughout the years, you know, that kids that, you know, these are obviously the formative years and up until they're five or up until they're seven, they're um, forming their personalities and and I'm just curious what your thoughts are on on that, if there is any specific number in that. And if what you think about, like, if it's too early to go to school or because preschool starts at three, right? Um, kindergarten's at five, but some you don't necessarily have to go until you're five. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on 
that if p- kids should stay at home more and be with their family and, and yeah. Well, the brain is still forming until you're 25. And in fact, even after that. So it's true that in the first year of life, the growth is exponential. And then the next year, it's still significant. And then the next year, it's still very significant. Mm-hmm. So any repeated experience will change the brain, right? Uh, and that's true now, and it's true as they get older. I, I hear you asking what's appropriate for, what's the best thing for child development when children are very small? And I would say that daycare situations are hard for very young children, for infants, for children under a year old, because it's not just one person responding to that child's needs. And if you have lots of babies to take care of, you know, you can't respond to what each individual child needs when they need it. So I think it's pretty clear that in the first year of life, uh, one-on-one care is a lot better. And it's great if that one-on-one care is with a person who is going to be permanent in the child's life, not with a nanny or a babysitter who's uh, changing, you know, who will, by definition, is unlikely to be permanent in the child's life. So The question then is about school and when school is appropriate. I think it's great for kids to be around other people and other children specifically uh, from the time they're little, but they don't really play directly, of course, when they're, you know, nine months old or 18 months old. Uh, we, We talk about parallel play, how they play in relation to each other, but not with each other. But that doesn't mean it's not play. It doesn't mean it's not a good thing to have happen. It's still great if they have their special person there to help them rather than being at a play group without the parent there. Um, As they get older, they can handle more and more time alone without alone, meaning navigating the world with the help of a teacher or a nanny or a babysitter of more than one child um, in, you know, with other children around. The research on daycare is that high quality daycare can be really great for say a 3 year old if it if the hours are limited the problem is that we send kids to daycare for way too many hours so if they're just going for the morning or they're just going you know they they take a nap and then they go to daycare from you know uh 2 to 5 um it actually works out great. Three hours a day for daycare is fantastic for a three-year-old to be, you know, sort of learning the world, not with mom and dad there. Uh, but full-day daycare, we do know that children's stress hormones, cortisol, get elevated when they are in full-day daycare when they're three years old. Uh, we know that the children who are who go to daycare in the morning and go home and have lunch and a nap and are with their family in the afternoon, their cortisol levels do not get elevated, artificially elevated. So we know there's something stressful that happens when the child doesn't get downtime then in the afternoon after having a morning at school. So I'm a big fan of children having being picked up. And, you know, that doesn't mean that dad or mom has to be with the child, although if dad or mom can do that, at least some of the afternoons, how wonderful, because then that's extra time for bonding for them. But it could mean a babysitter picks them up. That does not elevate the cortisol. What elevates the cortisol is when they're in a group situation where no one's responding just to their needs, because it it is a little stressful to be in a group situation with other kids. And that means if they're in a group situation all day, those kids are, are more likely to come home and bite or spit or in some way express, uh, you know, move more quickly into a stressed out situation when parents set limits because they're feeling more stress anyway. They don't have as much in the way of inner resources. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love that there's research around that as well. And my other question for you is you've written an entire book on how to stop the fighting and raise friends for life for siblings. And I'm curious, you know, there's, I, I'm really into ancestral healing and, and healing the trauma that people inherit through generations and stuff. And so I'm curious, 
how you've seen or any experience you've had with parents who've had siblings that maybe they don't necessarily have a great relationship with, but don't want to repeat that pattern with their own children? Such a great question, because I will say that I hear parents all the time, they'll, parents will um, consult with me about a problem between their two children, and then it will come out in the discussion that, you know, yeah, my big brother beat me up a lot, or, um, you know, I was the oldest and my parents always favored the little one, and I always felt pushed aside and not loved. So we definitely can, and, you know, and then they're coming to me because they have a problem between their two kids. And often that problem is being replicated, right? The problem that they grew up with is now being replicated or they're favoring. You know, I talked to a mom just the other day who said she realized, you know, her older child who's, who is um, 13 uh, feels that she's always favored the eight-year-old and is very angry at her about it. And she realized she has always favored the eight-year-old, not intentionally. She doesn't actually love the eight-year-old more, but she herself was the younger child and she always felt unimportant and overlooked by both her parents and her older sister. So she has two girls also, and she's been favoring the younger one because she doesn't want the younger one to have her experience. And yet it has, you know, in a way, uh, given exactly the wrong results because sure, her, her eight-year-old doesn't feel overlooked, but now her older child feels overlooked and unloved. Exactly. <laughs> so it's so important to bring our awareness to whatever baggage we're carrying, uh, because if we don't, um, we're going to put that on our kids. It's just what happens, right? So if you know you have a problematic relationship with a sibling, it's very important to work that out. And that doesn't mean you have to call up your sibling and go into therapy together. It does mean you have to do work on it yourself. Whether you ever discuss it with your sibling is irrelevant, actually. It's not about working it out with them now. It's about you working out whatever pain you suffered as a child in relationship to your sibling. Because once you work out the pain, it's not there in your subconscious. When things are in our subconscious, they're no, not under our conscious control. And then they sort of have to get worked out somehow. So we end up, act, we can't articulate them, but we act those things out. And we we sometimes create, you know, we it's a, a pattern in our own childhood and we create that pattern for our children. So we don't want to do that, obviously, as you're saying. So do the work yourself. You know, have a few sessions with a therapist. Do some journaling about it. Talk to someone you trust. Go start to start a process where you work out your issues that you have from your childhood, whether that's with your siblings, your parents, um, just anything that was traumatic for you. If you work on it now, there's much less chance of you um, putting that on your children. And, and you'll liberate not only your children, but also yourself. Yeah, I completely agree. And what I've noticed is, I, so I'm ha having, well, by the time this podcast comes out, I probably, I definitely will have had my second child. I'm pregnant, so I'm going to have her any week now. And my husband and I are both the younger siblings. And so it just dawned on me the other day that we don't, and we also have really complicated relationships with our older sisters. The dynamic is different because we have an older brother and a younger sister in this situation. But what I've noticed is the complicated relationship. Like I mentioned, I don't want to repeat, but I still have a relationship with my sister. But what I also have found is our relate. Uh, when we talk, I mean, we talk about things, right? And they pick up on everything. And so um, I've noticed that, I mean, he hasn't said anything yet, but for example, I have um, also a really complicated relationship with my mother who I, um, I have been very close with, but over the last year, something happened and we've been, I had to set a boundary where I was I can't see her for a little period of time. And it's been really hard because she was a really big part of 
my son's life and helping us and whatnot, but something happened where I just needed to take time. But my son, who is so intuitive and kids are just so intuitive, the other day he said, what happened to Mimi and what did she do to you? And I said, oh my gosh, like he's just so incredible. And, and I wanted to share with him. So I said, you know, I, there, something happened where, um, I asked her not to do something and, and said, if she did do that, then I'm no longer able to, you know, I said like as much as I could, right. Like I'm no longer going to be able to be around her for a little while until we can work things out. And, and so he just kind of didn't say anything after, but I was like, he gets it. Like he knows. And so, um, yeah, I'm curious, like, and yeah, if you have any experience in that sort of situation as well, I mean, a two and a half year old to pick up on that is really impressive. And, and he's well, they- me crying. Right. And I think part of what you say too, is show your emotions with your children, like don't hold back. And so that was like, part of it too, is he has seen me cry over it. I don't try and hide it, but I'm not like super dramatic or, you know, whatever, but he's definitely seen me emotional about it. Yeah. He's known what you were emotional about. It sounds like. I think so. Yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. He said, what did she do to you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's seen that you were hurt. He's seen that you were hurt and he knew it had, that she had, that you were crying because of something to do with her. So he assumed she had hurt you. So I do believe that we uh, can be authentic with our children. I think it's very important to reassure them when we cry that it's nothing to do with them, if in fact it is nothing to do with them. And even when it is to do with them, I think it's really important that they never feel like it's their responsibility to take care of us because the feelings are always ours, even if we're hurt because they scream at us, I want a new mommy. (laughs) You know, it's still our responsibility, those feelings. It's not theirs and their children. And our job is to manage our own stuff. They don't actually, you know, they're they're just um, saying the worst thing they can think of to get our attention at that moment. But what you're describing is you were crying about something unrelated to him, but he knew what it was about. And that is a little tricky because whatever you're crying about, he would have an opinion about it, right? Like, let's say you have a fight with a partner, you're his dad. And he says, why are you crying? And you say, your daddy said something that hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, I think it that's a lot for him to take in because then he would be, of course, protective of you and mad at his father. So I think it is a little tricky to, you know, they're little, they're not supposed to be, involved in every nuance of our emotional lives, actually. Um, So it's better if we can do our processing without them, honestly, um, because otherwise they're going to want to know what it is that's upsetting us. But in this case, he knew that it was his grandmother and he has his own relationship with her and he would feel protective of you, but he also misses her, right? And so I think when you describe something that's a conflict. And, you know, conflict is part of every human relationship, right? Every, any two people will have different needs and wants, and there will sometimes be disagreements. That doesn't mean we can't become closer. It doesn't mean we can't work things out. Um, You and your mother had a disagreement about something. You said, please don't do this, or I won't be able to see you. And she did it, apparently, I'm I'm guessing from what you said. Yeah. Um, And And you said, okay, I'm going to need to take a little time here. Um, And so when you say that to your son, if you describe that to him, what would his takeaway be, I wonder? I wonder if he would think, well, mommy told me not to do that. Mommy told me. That's that's exactly when I was explaining to him. I was like, well, I don't want him to think I asked him not to do something and then he did it. And then, so I'm not going to want to see him or something. Right. So that's really, um, I'm glad you brought that up. So I think it's really important that, you know, he, they're not old enough to understand the nuances. So if they think, you know, you're, you might not speak to him for a while, (laughs) which would definitely be a, 
an emergency for him. I mean, children know that if we weren't responsive to their needs, they would not be fed, they would not be protected, they would in fact die. So it's an emergency if a parent isn't responsive to you. So they, it's a little tricky to say, well, you know, she did something I told her not to, and so I'm not talking, to speaking to her. So I think when he said, what did she do to you? I think it's important to share that grown-ups sometimes have things that are hard, that they're working out, and that, and not share the specifics of it. You know what I mean? So just say, yeah, your, your Mimi and I are, are working something out. It's hard right now, but we'll work. But this is really important. We will work it out. We will work it out and things will be okay again. But I needed a little bit of time to work it out. And if he says, did she hurt you? You could say, hmm, well, my feelings were hurt, but, you know, we had a different uh, we we had a different um um see i don't know if he even understands what an opinion is um we 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 had a difference about something that we're still working out but why can't we see me? he'll he'll ask right why can't we see mimi and you can say i'm not really ready to see mimi but it sounds like maybe you miss her do you miss her and then you can empathize with him and because that's really what this is about it's his feelings about his grandmother that matter here, right? Yeah, exactly. That's so beautiful. I love that approach. And exactly, I think, you know, it really is going back to what you said. It's at this age, like it's their perspective. And so that really puts things in perspective for me too, just knowing that they don't know that you have a different perspective than them. Yes. Thank you so much for that. That's really helpful for me. And and so I'm curious about your latest book then, which is a workbook. So please share a little bit about it with us. Hmm. So I wrote Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids. Uh, and, you know, it has three basic ideas that are the premise of all of my work, the foundation. The first is that we have a relationship with our children. It's not as parenting is not a set of strategies. Everything depends on the connection. And our influence with our child depends completely on our connection with them. So the relationship is is central. It's this is a relationship based model of parenting. Uh, the second is that emotion drives behavior. So if we want to change our child's behavior or help them to be their best selves, we need to coach them so that they can better handle their emotions. And then we see the behavior we want uh, and they're able to be their best selves. And then the third idea is that we can't do that kind of parenting unless we take care of ourselves, try to return ourselves to center when we get upset and regulate our own emotions. You know, if we're angry at our child, we can't coach them emotionally. We can't create safety for them. We can't connect with them. So those three ideas, connection, coaching, as opposed to threats and punishment and, and even rewards, really just coaching. Um, and then third, our own self-care and self-regulation. Those are the three ideas that are the foundation of my approach. I call the approach peaceful parenting because it results in more peace inside us and a more peaceful home. So that was the first book. And then the second book I wrote, and it's perfect for you right now, about to have a baby, is Peaceful Parent, Happy Siblings. And that the whole last third of the book is about how to introduce the new baby into the home. And there, it's got all the research and all the tips about how to help your older child adapt because it's a hard thing for them when a baby comes into the home. And the book, of course, continues. And the examples are mostly kids under the age of 10. But, you know, so it, it definitely addresses the younger set. But the principles are universal. So even if you have an eight and uh, 12 year old, it will absolutely be helpful to you. So that's the sibling book. So I wrote those two books. And then parents started to come up to me after my talks and say, you know, I have your first two books. I love them. Or not for your first two. I have your two books. I love them. And then they would say something like, 
but I'm still having a hard time setting limits. I'm too permissive or I'm too, um, I yell a lot. Um, I ha- still have a hard time regulating myself. I yell all the time. Or I still have a hard time connecting. I know you talk about connecting, but what does that actually mean? I, I feel like it's hard for me to empathize. And, and I don't really know whether I'm building the relationship I want with my child. So I wrote a new book, the workbook, that addresses the hardest things parents encounter, that the places parents always end up having problems, which are self-regulation. The whole first part of the book is on self-regulation. Connection. How do you actually connect? How do you develop the ability to empathize? How do you um, play games and have other uh, routines in your life that build a strong relationship? And then finally, how do you set limits? Even when you're mad, how do you set limits that your child will respond to and will cooperate with? What are the secrets of limit setting? In other words, discipline. So that's what the workbook is. And it allows you to master those skills. It's a skill building workbook for parents. And I know lots of couples who use it, who will do a page together uh, in the evening just to get on the same page about things or to build a skill or to just give them a starting point to discuss something. In fact, last night I I uh, gave a talk to a group that was a class uh, that Amy Wright Glenn, who is a um, doula and uh, she's a birth coach um, and also a Um, a coach for people who are a chaplain for people who are dying. Uh, And so she has a breadth of experience with human, human life. And she ran a class using the workbook where they would do 15 pages of the workbook at a time and then get together the following week and talk about it again. This was all on Zoom. So they had me in for a class to answer questions. So I um, I see that parents use the workbook and they'll say things to me like, this was better than therapy. Or, you know, I was in therapy for two years and this was so much better. I, I made such breakthroughs in being able to control myself and not yell at my kids. Uh, so that's what the workbook is. That's amazing. I need all three books. <laughs> and um, oh, well, I love it. I don't have a TV, so my husband and I can definitely do this in the evening if we can get our son to sleep, but maybe the book will help us to do that as well. Um, but I am curious if you have a few minutes to share with us some, um, just like the basics. And obviously, it sounds like you go really in depth into just like bringing the new baby home and and recommendations around that. But what do you what are uh, certain things that you do recommend? I mean, my son definitely knows that he's going to have a sister and he's very, um, he's been with us every step of the way at all my midwife appointments at home and everything. But uh, still the concept of like this baby is actually going to come out of my belly is, you know, it's going to completely change his life. He's never going to be alone ever again with us. I mean, he will, we'll make time for that, but you know, it's never going to be just him. It's a shock to little children, to even to older children. It's a shock when the baby is born and they suddenly, you know, my son, I remember him saying, uh, initially he said, um, when can we send her back? And finally, I think he, and he, he went into a full-fledged panic when he realized she wasn't actually leaving. Right. I think that even though they, quote, know, unquote, and they've been involved, I think it's just hard for them. So I would say um, when you bring your child home, the first thing to do is to have your partner or a parent or someone else carry the new baby in. Do not walk in with the baby in your arms. Walk in with your, if you presuming your child is home greeting you uh, and has been there with someone else. Um Hand the new baby to someone else and you go in with your arms open and grab your child up and tell him you missed him and you can't wait to do whatever with him that he loves to do that's fun. And for him, it's not about the the new baby. It's about that he's just been separated from you. So he needs that connection with you, right? That's the most important thing. And then after you've spent five minutes connecting you say, hey, you want to meet your little sister? 
And you sit down with him on the couch and he's next to you and you put the baby into his arms and you let him um, smell the top of her head. Now, we don't know for sure that this works, but apparently babies' heads give off pheromones. And you know how people say, oh, oh, new babies, they smell so good. Those pheromones, when we inhale the pheromones, we fall in love. And it makes us feel protective of the child. So you want him to feel protective of his little sister. So let him say, smell the top of her head. Doesn't that feel smell good? And then you might have um, a little gift exchange. Maybe before the birth, he has helped you choose a lovey, a special blanket or a soft toy for the newborn. And you have also picked something out for him. And then when, you know, he's held the baby for a bit and you've done a little bonding and you've, you've said things like, oh, look how she loves to hear your voice. She recognizes your voice because you always talk to her when she was growing, when she was inside me. And he'll be shocked that she was inside you and now she's outside. I mean, it's sort of a shocking thing, right? How do you wrap your mind around that? But then you say, and you know what? She has a present for you. And you have a present for her, right? The lovey we bought. So you you let her, you know, you 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 bring out the present for him. And she you say, it's too big for her to give you. So I'm gonna help her give it to you, and you give it to him, you know. Um, and you take out the lovey that he picked out for her, that he wrapped for her, explain to the baby how Big Brother picked it out. And then you tell Big Brother how much the baby loves this thing, how much she loves him. And, you know, she can't wait to watch him do all the great things. Um, and the good thing about this is that for years, he will sort of take pride in that he gave her the lovey, which means he's not likely to take it away from her and tease her. He's going to be like that. It was his largesse that gave her the lovey. And that's a good thing. It makes him feel like he's generous inside. Um, and then I would say, you know, we could keep going, but I won't keep going, you know, too much. But I will just say, you don't make everything about the baby. Delight in him. Spend time with him as much as you can. I'll, I see a lot of couples make the mistake of the dad takes the older child and mom takes the new baby. Because, you know, if you're nursing, you're with the baby. But in fact, it's super important that as much as possible, you're able to take him also. And since you spend so much time nursing and also trying to sleep, um, you know, the baby takes a nap, you might want to sleep too. Um, so very important that you spend as much time with him as possible, one-on-one -on -one if you can. Um, and if you're with both of them, that you say things to the baby like, oh, you're so lucky that you have him as your big brother. He, you know, he he knows what babies need because, you know, you talk about what do you think she needs with him? And when you say that, we talked about empathy at the beginning. When you say to him, hmm, why do you think she's crying? What do you think she needs? That actually has been proven to develop empathy in the older child and also, you know, it develops his ability to realize that she does have a perspective and a set of needs. And also, it develops a better relationship between the children. A year later, they have a better relationship when you do things like ask him, you know, what do you think she needs? What do you think she, you know, we should do? She's crying. Oh, let's go get your baby. She's crying. You want to come with me to get your baby? Oh, look, she's crying. What do you think she needs? And what happens is, he starts to feel responsible for her and like he knows how to meet her needs and he cares about her. He's invested in her in the same way that you've become invested in her. So we could keep going for a long time, but those are just some of the tips in the book that you'll find. I love that. And I love the way you share everything. Everything that you said today really resonated with me. Your your voice, it's so calming. Just your books. I'm so happy that people have access to them and I can't wait to purchase all of them. And I'm just really happy that um, we were able to ha take a moment to chat today. I really appreciate you sharing your time with us and your wisdom. And thank you for all that you do. 